Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. A couple of days ago, you will hopefully have seen my review of the Ryzen 9 4900HS, the very first Ryzen 4000 APU to hit the market, bringing with it pretty game-changing performance in mobile form factors. Despite only being a 35 watt TDP part, the 4900HS easily beats Intel's 45 watt 6 and 8 core CPUs in long-term productivity workloads and matches it in other areas Intel usually dominates. I was very impressed with the performance and it sounds like a lot of other people that checked out the APU in the ASUS Zephyrus G14 came to the same conclusion. The video did get a lot of comments though, a few questions about various different things, so I wanted to address some of those things here and provide even more information about how we tested and how the Ryzen 9 4900HS performs. So yeah, let's get into some odds and ends and answer some of your comments and questions. So one of the comments here is, MATLAB uses Intel native code paths even for AMD. So that would be why you're seeing those numbers for it. Um, yeah, this is probably the most commented thing on this video. We've been asked this question many times, even on social media. So uh, let's answer this one in detail and explain what's going on. So firstly, yes, in some versions of MATLAB, there was a bug, you could say, that meant AMD CPUs would not use AVX2 instructions to execute some functions. The reason for this is that on Intel CPUs, MATLAB would use Intel's MKL or Math Kernel Library for these functions. Naturally, this isn't an optimal code path for AMD CPUs, so MATLAB would revert to a different code path on AMD. The bug comes about because this code path should have been AVX2 for optimal performance rather than whatever slower option MATLAB was actually choosing. And some users discovered that with a certain flag, you could force MATLAB to use AVX2 and AMD processors for much better performance. The bug, and yeah, I'm not entirely sure whether it was a bug, an oversight, or just failure to properly code for Ryzen CPUs, was resolved in the latest version of MATLAB, which is R2020A. This properly sets the MKL workaround flag, so AMD processors now use AVX2 and performances much closer to Intel CPUs. In some functions, this would lead to a more than 2x performance improvement. So firstly, we already tested Ryzen 4000 with R2020A. I didn't put it in the graph. I probably should have in hindsight, probably would have cut out a lot of these questions, but yes, we tested with R2020A. So the workaround was already applied by default. We were getting the best performance Ryzen has to offer in MATLAB, no need to set flags and all that sort of stuff. When discussing our results with AMD before we published the video, AMD actually informed us that R2020A did have significant performance updates for Ryzen, but at that stage we were already using it for testing, so we didn't have to do anything, we're already fully up to date. On top of that, our benchmark was actually never affected by the Intel MKL issue in the first place. That's because we don't use the built-in benchmark, but instead a custom script that exclusively runs two of the most heavily used functions in all of MATLAB, and that's ODE45 and FFT, and we run each of those 1,000 times. As far as I'm aware, these functions are not affected by the MKL and slower AMD code path issue. In fact, right from the start, performance in these functions has always been around parity on equivalent AMD and Intel processors, not twice as fast on Intel like with other functions, and the workaround in older versions didn't improve performance. This was actually visible in the original dis Reddit discussion and those sorts of places. If you look closely at the, the charts that show before and after performance, you'll see ODE and FFT performance is not affected, but people were, I think, mostly focused on the other problematic performance things. So in any case, our MATLAB benchmark is not affected by this particular problem and is an accurate reflection of how these CPUs perform. It's been that way for over a year now when we've been benchmarking MATLAB, we don't want any dodginess going on. We're giving you guys an accurate reflection of how optimized version of the software for these processes performs on either brand, I guess you have to say. It's actually the case with Ryzen 4000 that ODE solving is marginally faster on AMD processors while FFTs are slower. If we look at the built-in MATLAB R2020A benchmark on Ryzen 4000 and Intel, we see similar, the Ryzen 9 4900HS is faster at ODEs, slightly slower in LU and sparse, and slower in FFTs. Previously, it was the LU and sparse workloads that would be twice as slow on Ryzen. I think it's also worth mentioning that the last couple of updates to MATLAB have significantly improved performance on both Intel and AMD processors, and this latest R2020A version seems to have cleared that up, the final performance issues up with AMD. So while yes, 
AMD performance is a lot better these days. Performance on both processors is continually being optimized. So yeah, that's a full comprehensive breakdown of performance on MATLAB with these Ryzen 4000 processors. We always wanna give you guys the most accurate information. And yeah, for a while now, our benchmarking of this application, which is widely used by engineers, and that's why we include it, um, has not been affected by any non-optimization on AMD processors. Seriously impressive hardware. Let's hope it actually works out in ultrabook like consumer notebooks for 800 euros or so. so. Well, it's interesting you say that because AMD has told us that we can expect Ryzen 4000 APUs to cost around the same as previous generations. So whatever market segment was previously using, say a Ryzen 7 3750H, should now be able to access a Ryzen 7 4800H for a similar price. In the H series, that should mean 4800H configurations between $800 and $1,000. I think the first variants like the ASUS Tough series may target the upper end of that range, but they should still be quite affordable. As for the Ultrabooks, which you mentioned, um, we actually already have pricing for a few products. The Lenovo Yoga Slim 7 will be starting at $850 US dollars. I'm not sure which U series processor that cheap version will include, but even something like a Ryzen 5 4600U in the base model would be quite impressive, giving six cores and 12 threads at that price. We also know that Acer will have more budget to mid-range class options for five to $600, which is set to use Ryzen 5 and perhaps even Ryzen 7 for as low as $650-ish. So I don't think these sorts of chips will be overly expensive. Of course, some OEMs might recognize the power that AMD's Ryzen parts provide and start charging more compared to Intel, especially if U-series performance pans out that way, but yeah, I kind of doubt it. I'm curious about operating clocks, especially in Cinebench R20 when power hits 35 watts. Is it around base clock 2.9 to 3 gigahertz or what exactly? So the base clock of the Ryzen 9 4900HS is 3 gigahertz, so we never see it drop below that, but generally in long-term workloads at 35 watts, I was seeing around 3.2 gigahertz sustained, whether that's Cinebench R20, Blender, or Handbrake. That said, with Cinebench, you need to run it about three consecutive times before it starts falling down to 35 watts. These Ryzen chips can maintain boost for a long time, much longer than Intel processors, uh, which does assist with some short-term workloads a fair bit. Want to hear a counterproductive but funny idea? Threadripper Mobile. Yeah, I, I actually don't think this is a bad idea or anything. What we've seen Intel do over a few generations now is increase core counts within the same TDP bracket to keep competitive. Yes, we get lower clocks across the increased number of cores, but generally running at lower clocks is more efficient. So the CPU ends up sitting in a more efficient position on the clock voltage curve and therefore delivers better performance. We've seen this a few times now with parts like the eight core 9880H over the six core 9750H or the six core Core i7-10710U over the quad core Core i7-8565U. So I think it could be possible in a future generation for AMD to develop yeah, an even higher core count mobile processor, whether they call this Threadripper Mobile or not, who knows, but there could be room in the mobile market for a 60 watt-ish 12 or 16 core processor for creator workloads. There are lots of beefy laptop designs out there that already push to 60 watts or higher with parts like the Core i9-9980HK. So I don't see why this wouldn't be possible with AMD, but even if they don't go on a higher power budget or anything like that, a 45 watt 12 core could deliver better performance and efficiency, and that'd be amazing for something like video encoding. The downside is it probably wouldn't be as suited for gaming, depending on how the frequency situation plays out. So that sort of part would be better suited to a workstation laptop type Threadripper mobile thing. Of course, it would also require an entirely new monolithic die. These Ryzen 4000 APUs top out at eight cores and they just can't add more through additional chiplets given they're not using that design. I wonder what AMD's mobile department will be like in the future, Navi APUs maybe. Yeah, I think I think that's the goal for the future. There's, they're not gonna stick around with Vega forever. It almost sounds like a stopgap for this generation while they still work on RDNA 2. I don't think the efficiency of first gen RDNA was quite there for APUs right now, having spoken to a few people at AMD, but I'd fully expect a shift to RDNA 2 for the next generation, especially as AMD recently and proudly touted about how much RDNA 2 is much more efficient than their previous design. I just can't believe the efficiency and it's faster than my 3600X in Cinebench. It's staggering. Yeah, got, got a few comments like this. Some even asking how the Ryzen 9 4900HS compares to desktop processors in benchmarks like Cinebench. So I'll put my Ryzen 9 4900HS numbers into Steve's benchmark chart for Ryzen desktop processors. 
and see where it stacks up. We're going to have to make room here between the Ryzen 7 2700X and Ryzen 7 3700X. Naturally, we're not quite at the level of a 3700X. It's a 65 watt class processor that consumes more power. So we'd expect it to perform better, and it does. But the 4900HS does handily beat the Ryzen 5 3600 by around 14% in this test, while narrowly edging out the Ryzen 7 2700X. While the score we do get here is an average of three runs, and almost all this test is run in a boost state, long-term performance is more around a score of 3800-ish, which is still very impressive for a 35 watt part. It's still faster than a 3600 in that configuration. It also doesn't make Intel's desktop processors look particularly powerful when you have a 35 watt CPU beating the Core i7 8700K and Core i7 9700K, whether in boost or locked down to 35 watts. I was actually quite gobsmacked when I was first running tests on these systems and compared it to something like the Core i7-8700K that was a flagship super fast processor just a few years ago. Now we're getting better creator performance in a mobile form factor. It's yeah, hard not to be impressed with that situation. Just imagine when software developers start optimizing applications for AMD CPUs also, then there will be a considerable delta. Yeah, this is... Yeah, it's another sort of comment that cropped up a lot. People talking about various different companies like you know, Adobe with Photoshop, Microsoft with Excel, MathWorks with MATLAB, all not optimizing their software for Ryzen processors. But I actually don't think this is what's going on with these workloads. As I mentioned in my original review, part of this seems to be down to a smaller cache than Intel's equivalent processors and inferior memory latency. So while every other aspect of these processors is more powerful, it's not the ultimate CPU. There are some areas to the hardware where Intel does have an advantage. Yes, Intel does have an advantage in some areas with their, their 14 nanometer CPUs. The reason I say this is margins do close up considerably in these applications when you look at the desktop lineup. Photoshop is a largely single-threaded application, and in Puget's own benchmarks using their benchmark that we also use for our review, the Core i9-19900K is less than 2% faster than the Ryzen 7 3800X. And we know from our Cinebench R20 numbers that the 19900K and 3800X perform very similarly in the single-threaded test. With Ryzen 4000, we have the Ryzen 9 4900HS performing almost 7% better than the Core i9-9880H in Cinebench R20 single thread, but then falling 10% behind in Photoshop. To me, that's not highlighting an issue with optimization. We know with the desktop CPUs that Photoshop and Cinebench results are basically on par with Intel and AMD, yet with these Ryzen 4000 APUs, we're seeing lower performance. I think what we're seeing is we're just running into cache limitations of this processor that I described in the review. And I can understand why AMD opted to cut cache considerably from the 32 meg that they provide with the eight core desktop CPUs uh, down to just eight megabytes with this monolithic die. Cache takes up a lot of die space. And when they're putting in eight CPU cores and eight GPU compute units into a compact package, not a lot of space left for a massive cache. But also cache is quite power hungry and AMD still doesn't seem to be quite there with power compared to Intel. So cache is one area I believe they've tried to limit to try and keep power down. Hopefully this improves with the next generation. Can you guys disclose when the Ryzen 4000 U-series reviews will be coming out? So we're not under NDA on Ryzen 4000 U-series. We're just waiting for laptops to hit the market that will have U-series processors inside. I expect we won't be waiting too long for that. We're in April now, so likely we'll have data for you this month if all goes to plan, fingers crossed. What if both CPUs used the same system for determining TDP? Considering how radically different they are formulated, would it equate or do you think they're still more efficient? Um, yeah, while there's a lot of confusion around the TDP with desktop processors because they mostly just ignore it in favor of boosting up to whatever power limit they like, on laptops it's a very different situation. When both Intel and AMD says a processor is 45 watts, these chips do actually run at these power levels or very close to it in long-term workloads as seen in Hardware Info and also when we do some you know, from-the-wall power measurements through the power brick. And that's because they need to. Laptop OEMs, yeah, they literally design cooling solutions specifically to dissipate this exact amount of heat and not much more. After all, they don't have much space for a cooler. So each lineup of processors actually needs to do what they say on the box. It's pretty critical. Yes, they do boost above this in short-term workloads, but for mobile, long-term, they consistently fall back to whatever long-term limit is set, which is 
usually left to the default 45 watts, which is, yeah, I guess why we can do a few of those efficiency comparisons. I'm actually more interested on the 4800H, 4900H, where it is possible to disable one of the CCX and leave four core eight thread enabled while using the power budget to overclock the Vega iGPU and gain more frames that way. Um, it's still unclear whether any sort of Ryzen mobile overclocking will be supported. AMD officially says that they won't be adding comp compatibility <laughs> into a program like uh, Ryzen Master. It'll be left up to OEMs to include the appropriate utilities. Maybe that's changed since I last spoke to them, but that's what I heard. So while it yeah, would be nice to be able to do stuff like disable a CCX for improved performance and being able to send more power over the iGPU, I'm, I'm not sure whether this will be actually feasible in laptops. Uh, unless you get an awesome OEM utility that lets you do that. May you guys go into more depth with the iGPU gaming performance. I'd love to see if Renoir delivers a console level experience while accounting for features like Radeon image sharpening. Honestly, probably won't be doing that with the H series processors. I don't see much reason to do this when I don't think any OEMs will include just this APU alone without a discrete GPU. Certainly all the ones that have been announced so far are pairing Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 9 with NVIDIA graphics or even AMD's Navi options in some designs. However, we will try to go into even more detail on iGPU gaming with the U series. I fully expect most designs not to bother with low power NVIDIA graphics like an MX250. So We'll look into that and see how it compares to an Intel U-Series plus MX250 type product and of course Ice Lake. Yeah, iGPU gaming set to be, I think, pretty decent with Renoir. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that sort of comparison. So I think that'll, yeah, do it for this one. I think it's answered a lot of the main comments and questions that we were getting on the original review, sort of the, the MATLAB stuff, the desktop comparisons, and what's going to be happening going forward with some of our reviews and all that sort of stuff. So hopefully you enjoyed a bit of a responding to comments episode on this particular review. I've got a lot more mobile coverage coming up. We've still got a, a look at Ryzen 4000 gaming with a discrete GPU. We'll be doing some CPU limited tests, some GPU limited stuff to see how everything fares there. So stay tuned for that. I think it'll be coming out on the channel next week, hopefully. And then of course, we've got the recently announced 10th gen and Nvidia Super stuff that we'll be able to compare to all of this in yeah the coming weeks. So Great time to be subscribed to Hardware Unboxed. Check out the Patreon page as well if you're interested. Links are in the description. I'll catch you in the next one.